The following is an interview with Professor of Philosophy, now retired, William Desmond. Professor Desmond is known for putting forward a fourfold according to which objects in reality or concepts can be dealt with in terms of univocity, reducing difference between A and B. For example, B is located in A, A in B. Equivocity, where neither A nor B are reducible to each other. Dialectic, where A is defined in terms of B or B in terms of C. And the metaxis, where there is a space in between A and B that somehow pulls them together definitionally without reducing one to the other or without reducing both to some uh, equivalent object C. In the course of this interview, we're going to deal with that idea, the idea that what is common is not on the level of the objects that it is common to. I would note that whenever the term that work, this work, the previous work is used in this conversation, the specific work being referred to is desire, dialectic, and otherness which I use to formulate most of my questions, but which Professor Desmond very kindly answers in terms of his later developments. Metaxology is, in my opinion, extremely significant for various reasons which are drawn out in, in the course of this conversation. I won't spell them out here, but my questions and the sorts of issues that I try to um, bring up are uniquely dealt with by Professor Desmond in a way that I haven't encountered elsewhere in modern thinkers, with a few exceptions. No further vacillation, here we go. One of the questions you asked was about the infinite of succession and the, in what I called intentional infinitude there. But in fact, I, mean, I indicate that I would be more hesitant about talking about intentional infinitude because it seems too much, uh, I feel like, proleptically uh, defined, whereas in later work where the sense of the porosity of being and the passio ascendi come more to the fore, there are layers of more original sources out of which the intentionality itself emerges. So you'd get a more sophisticated understanding of the, if, if I could use the Augustinian term, the restlessness of, of, of the human heart, the, the restlessness of human desire. Uh, intentional infinitude carries that sense of a movement forward that we ourselves initiate, whereas I think it's much more more, more nuanced now in terms of something is already received before we think we are moving forward. And in the end, really, we're not just simply moving ourselves forward through, through our own uh, self-determining power. It's, it's, a, it's a much more, um, at least I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a richer sense of uh, our infinite restlessness, if, if I could put it that way, you know. Because it becomes aware of itself as only partial or as only the appearance of our actual moving forward, which isn't coming from us at all? Well, I think that, you know, generally human beings have a tendency to think that temporarily we, uh, we, we move into the future and that our desire is also future oriented, which in one sense it is. But the very sources of our desire are not just simply defined by a future orientation. Uh, there's an opening up in us that is deeply uh, enigmatic and mysterious that allows the possibility of desire at all. And I'm not sure that actually you should describe the sources of desire or just as, as, as in the terms of desire, that there's something more more received, something more opened. Again, this is where this notion of our being as a porosity uh, has some uh, traction, I think, and the notion of the patience of being, the passio sendi, that there's a, there's a kind of giftedness to the fact that we are opened to what is beyond ourselves, that also we're opened to the future. So, it, you know, one, one way to put it is this way, for instance, in 20th century philosophy, and I think in general in Western culture, the word project has taken on huge uh, pervasive significance. We talk about our academic projects, uh, we talk about even our children as our projects and so on. Uh, you get it in Heidegger. Heidegger is, you know, like the notion of the human being as a, a projection. Um, and I, I find that deeply problematical if it's taken to be a description of our, 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 our ecstatic desire. Because again, it, it, it favors a certain futurity 
that doesn't do justice to the fact that we're given to be at all in the first instance and that we're given to be as this this very mysterious enigmatic creature that is opened to what is beyond itself is is opened not that it simply opens itself this 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 being opened to me uh is 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 again a kind of a step back into more original sources of our own selving which which are usually forgotten because again there is this if you like as i said earlier this proleptic dimension to 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 desire um and, and so i i i i i think that is a an area where a philosophical exploration of of origins can as it were reach across to theological notions like grace for instance you know just to take that as a a very um canonical instance but that 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 was not evident that's that's not so evident in that early work there are hints of it here and there but um the 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 the, the forward movement of desire and desire dialectic and otherness it's a movement from lack desire as lack towards this again metaxological intermediation with a sense of an infinite that is more than our own infinite restlessness um where some sense of an answer to the infinite dimensions of the original lack are 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 are, are offered but i don't i don't think that it's it, it it does it's it's not true to say that desire originates in lack it does originate lack but there's more in lack than just lack and so these other notions like the porosity and the passio and so on are efforts to 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 offer a richer account of and and they, they actually i think they have huge repercussions just even in contemporary western culture in particular where this uh, almost idolatry of autonomous self determination has seems to have taken over the whole field reconfigured the whole ethos of being for so many people that the sense of being given to be the sense of life itself as a as a kind of a gifted um uh communication uh, these things these 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 latter things have fallen into a kind of forgetfulness on our part our very success in moving forward has made us forget that we're allowed to move forward on the basis of things that are not a matter of just our own projection into the future yes but if if i may desire can be about feeling oneself to be in unstable in a way that requires almost the invention of ground even if philosophically or intellectually one comes to that vision of instability and i think with that early work and i i i did hear you speak more recently and and it wasn't to do with that work obviously it was on occasion of your um retiring uh but i think with that early work the the, the contemplation perhaps the early modern contemplation although you do get it in classical philosophers as well of the infinite or the possibility of infinite forms leaves you with or leaves can leave one with the sense that one's own form is so arbitrary and and yeah. so purely given that it causes this kind of negative or destructive desire for the invention of a stability that doesn't exist or perhaps the desire for a finite creation which we can center ourselves within which also comes through i think in some of bruno and and the cousa's critiques of uh, some of the theology that they encountered more destructively with bruno but there is that that idea that you you shouldn't be looking for stability or desiring after stability for what you are by inventing a finite creation but rather embrace an infinity that actually is nurturing enough or is wholesome or or um uh hospitable i think is the word you use to the finite form yeah. the particular finite form yeah i mean i i i agree completely with what you're saying and i mean it's something that i've tried to articulate as best as i can but we we often only discover that by going through a process where uh, we so to say fall to one side or fall to the other um i mean this this whole question of the instability and in desire itself is is um in the end actually it's really inseparable from the question of of evil and our own claims you know to be as gods you know that seems to move sideways in one sense but uh you know and we're in a certain sense in the business of trying to endorse the serpent when he tells us you too will be as gods but again in the kind of thoughts that i offer 
I see that as a kind of a, an endeavor to be that takes over the whole of not only our own selving, but would want to actually take over the whole of being um, in the interests of, in a way, protecting us from exposure to the the the, the fact that the original gift of being at all is something that is not a matter of our own self-determination. That indeed the very goodness of being, of the to be at all, is in the first instance something received, and we receive it, and we experience it intimately, but uh, it's experienced as our participation in the good, which we then are tempted to think of as the good. So is that a kind of a self-circling endeavor to be or canatus uh, wants to elevate itself into the whole. Uh, so to, to, to find that poise between being received into being and endeavoring to be in response to the initial gift, I mean, that's part of the 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 search for a wise a wise living in an ethical and religious sense uh, but but mostly we're 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 falling to one side or the other perhaps or it's not even a falling it's might even be a choosing of ourselves in such a way that uh we actually lose ourselves in 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 in, in choosing ourselves in that 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 falsely absolute way. It's an absolute way in one sense, but it's it's uh, it's uh, it's it's claiming to be number one when always in the end we're 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 we're, we're seconds. We're, we we will always be seconds, marked by the gift of the number one, so to say. But a strange gift that wants to be always number one, or is tempted, let's say, rather than always wanting to be. Because I think you can you can you can you can be purged so to say of the, the, the that that the hubris of a more tyrannical eros if, if i could put it in that way um but again i, I think maybe the the purchase of your question also is that for human beings it's not just a question of receiving it's also we have to if you like do ourselves we have to self this notion of selving which originally i came across in germany hopkins it's it's in in the end really a poise between receiving and endeavoring um but it's you know that there's a phrase in hopkins you know for 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 this i came uh you know each one i i, 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 haven't, got, I haven't got the quotation to hand now but it's it's when i talk about the passio ascendi it's not the a passiveness that's the opposite of the endeavor to be or the canatus there's a kind of a there's a line of development and unfolding in the the way receiving turns into endeavoring and often our endeavoring is ungrateful to the receiving and then things get out of alignment so to say but there can be an endeavoring that in its own way uh, keeps open that 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 uh, porosity to the more original source out of which it receives its own energy of self-surpassing yeah the the image that comes to mind both when i was reading that book and and hearing you speak um and this might be an occasionalist view actually is of a, a mantle on a table and you can relate to yourself to your selving to your life as project in the same way that you think of a pattern on that mantle without really believing that each thread leads to another thread necessarily and accepting that every one of those threads is held up by the same table underneath so that there's a constant receiving anyway every yeah. moment of your of your life or every part yeah. but the selving comes in almost just as an aesthetic admiration for that which you yourself are that which you are in relation to others which is actually what you are etc cetera, etc cetera, right it's it, it becomes to me and you know often this gets criticized but it it does become an aesthetic vision it does just become about yeah. the parts being drawn together aesthetically rather than, than uh, yeah, necessarily leading into each other or being striven to by each other. Just just one word there on the aesthetic. I mean, there are different interpretations of the aesthetic, as you know. And in some of my work, like in Art Origins and Otherness, what I try to do there is actually explore a secret 
uh, uh, affiliation between the aesthetic and the sacred or the religious, which throughout the long history of human creation of artworks and so on, like is is you know it's it's not denied at all. It, in some ways, not a big deal made about it in a kind of a, th a theoretical or an academic sense. But I think that from around the end of the 18th century, there's a displacement of the sense of transcendence from its home in religion to the aesthetic. And um, it's uh, it's an equivocal displacement because the name of the religious is often put into recess. It's not acknowledged as such. So this... this, this um, this deeper community between art and religion is something that seems to me to be a, a problematic issue for enlightenment and post-enlightenment uh, thinking and humanity as a whole. And I, I would say that, you know, I, I just at the moment uh, in press, I have a book called The Gift of Beauty and the Passion of Being. And the subtitle is On the Threshold Between the uh, Aesthetic and the Religious. So I'm trying to, again, with the help of notions like the porosity of being, the passio sendi, and so on, uh, indicate that or the gift of beauty itself is deeply related to this passion of being. But in the end, this passion of being is not something that we determine simply through ourselves alone. There's something that exceeds an economy of autonomous self-determination, and that opens us to sources of inspiration that exceed our own uh, ability to master or call them forth so uh, it is it, in a way it's a redoing of hegel's doctrine of absolute spirit of art religion and philosophy but it's also a redoing of kierkegaard in the sense that he has the aesthetic the ethical and religious and i want to try and argue for a more a porous dialogue or communication between between those in, including also the ethical Whereas, for as you were describing the aesthetic there, it has a, it seems to me a kind of a, almost a Kierkegaardian uh, tonality to it, where it, it, it's the kind of it playing with possibility in a manner that sometimes runs away from the seriousness of the ethical and the, the you know the the the, the awful question of the, of the religious. Now again, I I think you're right because we live in a highly aesthetic culture where we're more at home at playing with possibilities. We don't want actuality, so to say, to um, make us too uncomfortable with having to, on occasion, choose more fundamental possibilities. So we're we're living in a highly aesthetic culture in that sense. And how to, uh, and perhaps this was the deeper intention of Kierkegaard, show how even in that, the the, the religious is always there as a companioning um, presence um, and and also indeed I think the ethical the great the great works of aesthetics have uh, you know the ones that we take seriously are those that have powerful ethical and religious um, challenges for us um, so that's that's you you saw you saw how in the the earlier book I talk about the the sublime. And again, that was way back in the, when I wrote that was in the late 70s, didn't appear until 80, 87, but it became a theme then with the postmoderns, as you know, Leotard and others. But I think the recurrence of the sublime since the 18th century is testament at a deeper level, actually, to the kind of malnourishment for religious otherness that, uh, generally speaking, seems to be a, 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 a serious factor in, in, in modern culture as a whole. Uh, the original concern with the sublime, I think, in the 18th century is is really inseparable from a, an effort to have a sense of given nature as more than a dead, neutral clockwork. And the kind of interest of the postmoderns in the technological sublime there's 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 a hidden but never or at least rarely acknowledged religious dimension to the sense of what is other or more than us or in excess of us it's it's a kind of atheistic um piety for the sublime of sorts which again i think does it does raise serious questions to be sure but uh, the religious sides of it outside of i mean there are as you know yourself in certain circles due to people like von balthasar and others um, 
the the stress on the beautiful is is seen certainly as a a hugely significant way to at least show something of of a, a world that is already charged with a, a kind of sacred significance yeah i think sometimes when we hear the word sublime we think of uh, an almost traumatic sort of beauty or even a traumatic sort of ugliness that suspends our our thinking enough to allow us to to experience some kind of transcendence but i think when you're admiring something aesthetically the the admiration is, comes from there being a pattern that you can discern or that at least some part of you can discern even if not your conscious mind and so it gives you that ease and even a very humble life it doesn't have to be about playing with possibility because uh, you can look back on a very humble life in which very little has happened but you feel as though there's pattern to it all and it's sustained by an origin which is or a being yeah. which is patterning which likes pattern which enjoys form rather than entropy which uh and which is therefore responsible for those patterns yeah. that, that you discern i mean one of the interesting things about the beautiful or the sublime is that there's an element of seeing in it it's not a it's not an inference or a even an analogic an analogical judgment it's you, you you behold something you're taking out of yourself but you're taken out of yourself in a kind of transport into another space um and the element of the involuntary uh is not experienced as a kind of uh, humiliation to your desire to be autonomously self-determining quite the opposite it, it it fulfills your desire in a manner that is in another modality to to to, to just a, a kind of a willed self-determination and it's not an argument either in the sense that you it's not a theory about something enigmatically uh you know in, in you know sometimes the the intimation is of an infinity that we can't master at all but somehow the intimation has an immediate power to take you into another space and you don't understand what's happening to you but the experience is is is, is undeniable to someone who lays themselves open or is, is is and sometimes we don't even we we don't actually sometimes even lay ourselves open we we are opened uh, by by a piece of music a beautiful face and suddenly we're elsewhere uh, so that's 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 something extraordinary, really, when one thinks about it, you know? Yeah. The fact that it's not experienced as humiliation, I think, is because it, it's appealing to a part of us that wouldn't be what is humiliated. And Eric Vogelin, I mentioned him in one of the questions in, in my email. He he says something, I think he's making a almost political point, but it reminded me of the pact infinity that you discuss in, in, in this early work, where he talks yes. about how when one recognizes that one may live in an infinite universe or uh, universe in multiverses or whatever, or that there is at least a possibility of infinity, it delivers us back to what he calls the cosmological ecumene or these kind of pact projects, yeah. which are not yeah. really interested in occupying creation because what would that even mean? It's, it's not thought of as a finite creation that you can be done with. You can know it all and be done with it. All you do instead is, is limit yourself to seeing the, the universal in the particular, to copying the, the, the cosmos in the polity, which was the context in which he's referring to it. But, yeah. but this occurs in personal experience as well. You know, I, I don't need to extend this experience to the ends of the earth because the earth has no ends, and if it did, it wouldn't matter. All I need to do is extend this experience down into itself. Right. I, I, I was struck by that quotation in the question you sent to me that uh, Vogelin's claim about the earth being round and the universe potentially infinite. But the notion of the earth, be, you know, one of the themes that has recurred is the relation between the whole and the infinite. And of course, in the background of my own work, there is Hegel's own understanding of the infinite as in the end, really, the whole. That you know, and in the logic, he talks. He goes against the a, a kind of a dualistic opposition of finite and infinite, but he says that you must understand this as what he calls a self-sublating infinite, as a. But then he importantly adds as a single process. So the notion that there is one absolute whole, which in the end just mediates with itself, uh, 
No, I'm trying to argue against that because I think it 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 produces a kind of a closed universe, in fact, and isn't true to that sense of the infinite that actually can't be modelled on the metaphor of a, of a sphere or of a, a closed circle. And I mean, as I, I took it from the quotation there, that this 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 sense of 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 circling the earth uh, can dovetail with the notion of being conquering the earth you know we as the measure of the totality and um then your citation of uh, nicholas accusa and bruno it seems to me that as they're thinkers who who in this, as i as i understand them explode the idea that you you have one infinite that just simply circles around itself and hence constitutes in a totally imminent whole. So I I I I find myself very much um, in the same family space of considerations on that particular score. But I I just would add one thing that you know when I was in 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 the earlier years of my writing, deconstruction was in the ascendancy in America. So I was I lived in America during that time and. Uh, deconstruction took over like a kind of you know it was like a contagion in the sense that I don't think that people were doing an awful lot of thinking but it it was so hot that if you weren't speaking the language of deconstruction you weren't um, you weren't in the ball game but um, they were you know again the the general orientation was that any sense of the whole was a, a really bad thing and Hegel in those days was a really bad boy and uh I, I I I try to defend this notion of an open whole, in 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 the book Art and the Absolute. I try to give a more sympathetic reading of Hegel's aesthetics, by talking about the artwork as an open whole, and the the Hegelians themselves were delighted with that because it it rescued him from the the charge of a kind of totalitarian closure, but the deconstructionists didn't like any talk about the whole at all, so. I, I, I don't find myself at home with those who simply reject the notion of the whole. So this notion of an open whole is a way of trying to indicate that you do have integrities of being, the human being being one, for instance, but there's nothing closed about that integrity of being. Quite the opposite. You have a kind of self-transcending energy that exists always in relation to what is other to it. So is that a, a rethinking of wholeness and infinity seems to me to be something that can't just simply be Hegelian and it can't just some, simply be deconstructive. It has to find, uh, again, as I would put it, some more metaxological terms for thinking those two thoughts. What one could, I know that the scholastics, and I don't remember the Latin terminology, but they differentiate between um, an actual infinite universe yeah. or cosmos which they actually reject in line to a degree with classical philosophers and then the 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 potential infinity of forms that could arise from the creative agency of of the divine which they assert yeah. so that instead yeah. of a a whole an infinite whole one could take a page from their book and 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 talk about the infinite capacity to create wholes or a pattern in reality itself which tends towards yeah. wholeing yeah Right, yeah. I mean, that's a, you know, like the the tendency in the ancient world to see the infinite as somehow a, a derogation from intelligibility, that if something is intelligible, you draw, you drew a boundary around it. Uh, so Toa Pyron, the unlimited was in a sense identical with the unintelligible. But again, through Western history, the infinity of God changes the equation when we think about infinity. But then the danger is, of course, that God is so is is the actual infinite in such a manner that everything other, while finite, is is can can sometimes be seen in again this dualistic outlook where it's over against the infinite and the intimacy of communication between the divine and the created order tends to be lost in you know the temptation to dualistic opposition so the the thought of 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 the of god as absolutely infinite giving rise to beings other than itself a creation other than itself that itself is marked by the promise of its own kind of 
infinity. It would be, in the end, a derived infinity. It wouldn't be absolute infinity in the sense in which the divine source is, but nevertheless, it would it would mirror in its own way something of that more exceeding hyperbolic infinity of the divine. And if you, as you see, one of the reasons why I, the, 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 the metaxological thought is Hegel is not wrong at all in attacking dualistic ways of thinking because he can deconstruct them by indicating that there's an instability f from either the side of the infinite or the finite. So a metaxological thought isn't a recurrence to dualistic way of thinking, but a kind of a trans-dialectical way to think a togetherness that keeps a difference open. And a difference that in one, on one side actually is strongly defensive of the hyperbolic transcendence of, 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 of God, but on the other side is, is, is deeply committed to a radical imminence and intimacy of the divine. In, in everything that has been brought to be. So again, that seems like a paradoxical conjunction of opposites, but I think that it's, it's more true to the, to the ontological situation, so to say, than, than Hegel's, Hegel's version of the coincidentia positorum. I, I would say it's probably, I, I would find myself more at home with someone like Cusa than Hegel, precisely because Cusa retains this sense of the hyperbolic mystery of the divine. Um, but again, I, th I think after Hegel, then you just have a kind of, you have a finitization in which God disappears and then a self-infinitization on the part of humanity. That's certainly true in the 19th century into the 20th century, uh, you know, with particular currents where, you know, man is the master of all being and we become the project to actually become something like the divine power, with with with, with actually disastrous consequences in the 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 the, 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 the monstrous uh, ideological projects of the twentieth century. Uh, the, yeah. I think all of that has roots in, uh, you know, somebody said somewhere that in in the in 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 the early nineteen twenties, the two branches of the Hegelian school faced each other, the left Hegelians in the form of the Bolsheviks. And the right Hegelians in the form of the fascists. They're all much cruder than Hegel, of course, but there's something in Hegel's dialectic which equivocates on the intimacy of the human and the divine, and which allows the divinization of the, hu the human through itself alone. Um, and the consequences are, as I call it in another book, a counterfeit God and uh, in the end really uh, idolatrous politics too because you're looking in a sense for the transcendent in the transcendent rather than in the patterns that it creates i mean i i think the paradox that you were referring to before and i tried to get there through proclus because i sort of like to compulsively reduce everything to proclus um <laughs> th there's he considers the archetype of organization or or order which he takes to be plato's autoson and the timaeus and that's his reading of the Timaeus. It's in between us and the ineffable one. But yeah. precisely for that reason, it's it's nowhere other than in between us. Because it's the pattern according to which our relatedness has to unfold. Because the Logos, who he identifies with Zeus, contains it in his mind. And he's the one who puts it in the receptacle, makes the world, blah, blah, blah. So the only place where you can contemplate the one or approach the one is in terms of the patterns that are between people, between apparently right. discontinuous body so contemplation becomes compassion becomes community etc and that's very much well reading your approach to the between seems to be there it seems to be locating the transcendent in the harmony of relatedness of things that are imminent well i, I mean i would say that uh, like in, in 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 my books generally i've tried to approach the divine from below upwards which is not uh, just simply a matter of, again, the philosophical eros that wants to, through its own power alone, attain a kind of contemplation of the divine. Because I think in, in the movement, reversals take place where we realize that our endeavor towards the divine are, are already sub subtended by what we receive. But that said, I think what you're saying is, you know, like I, 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 I in, in, in someone like Hegel, there is a Spinozistic background where uh, 
there is a kind of a posited sense of the divine that is secretly at work, even though Hegel will claim to prove the argument along at every stage. And I think actually then he doesn't explore imminent richness. You see, there are a lot of philosophies since Kant will say we're philosophies of imminence and nothing but imminence. But it's often a postulated version of imminence that isn't fully open to the full richness, the saturated richness of given being. So I, I see certainly part of my own fidelity as a fidelity to that, that richness. And uh, and I discover in that given richness of imminence something that uh, is, is a sign, is a communication of what is beyond purely imminent terms. Uh, that's that's where, for instance, in, in God in the Between, I introduced this notion of what I call the hyperboles of being, where hyperbolic here is, I carry something of the Greek where hyperbalein, to be thrown above, that the, something, the hyperboles are happenings in imminence that can't be fully determined in imminent terms. Um, and they throw us above imminence, in imminence itself, so they're thresholds. Um, I think in the sense that, you, that if I understand what you were saying there about Proclus, Proclus' sense of the divine thresholds between the world in which we live and the the sense of the divine really as as um, as, as as hyperbolic even in a more radical sense than the too muchness of the given creation that we we we, we are gifted with. Does that does that make sense? Yes, um, I, I think that what's going on there is also perhaps the reason why, as far as I can see, the need to deconstruct that you were referring to before doesn't arise in, in your thought as a sort of urgency, and it certainly didn't arise in the times of, of Proclus or very recently even, is because there's no real sense that the, um, that the transcendent is a thing among things that will suppress the particularity of things and that right. you therefore need to sort of push back against. Um, yeah. it, it isn't that. It's, it's, right. it's, it's a harmony and any kind of harmony, or it's an order and any kind of order. Right, uh, I, I know. Yeah, I mean, I have that uh, intuition also about many of these pre-modern thinkers that they never thought of the divine as one being among other beings, that this is sort of a, a, a mystery that is both luminous and dark, and that contemplation of the things of the world and our own soul lead us to lead us in the direction of this 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 luminously dark mystery. But it they're that they they have often a, a sense of protocols in dealing with uh, dimensions of ontological being that we in modernity tend to univocalize. Uh, things and lack those protocols that allow us appropriately to even open ourselves to the question of what God might be. You mentioned liturgy in one of your questions, and it's, it, 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 it probably, something could probably be said about a liturgical relation to being as itself a kind of a, a dramatization of sacred protocols that place oneself in a properly porous or permeable uh, attitude to what exceeds all our efforts to make it a determinate thing or object or even self. Yeah, I think emphasizing relationality and, and harmonious ordering of people to each other also led them to have a sense of any kind of human divine relationship as mediated, as involving beings or representations of beings which were very social in, in, in how they had to be dealt with. So there might be a connection there as well. The, I think the context in which I mentioned liturgy might have been in terms of art and in what you have to say about art being porous to, to the sublime as a, in a sense, as its sacred dimension. And then that made me think of the Renaissance and certain orthodox criticisms of the Western experimentation with artistic forms that depict the sacred, perhaps that was a mistake, that, that kind of criticism. Perhaps precisely representations of the sacred ought to be open-ended and ought to allow not just for new forms, 
perhaps new patterns of, of liturgy, even within the old, but more so dynamic forms. Uh, I, I was thinking of El Greco when I was reading Desired Dialectic and Otherness. El Greco came to mind quite a bit because what he does is he takes, he's from a Greek background, but he's in, in Spain, in Toledo, he takes the Renaissance in, 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 I think, the direction of the sacred more clearly than anybody else does, but also more dynamically than anybody else does. His yeah. forms are vibrating. They're, they're literally open in, in some cases. Well, you know, just uh, apropos of this notion of form, um, again, in, in this, this book, uh, The Gift of Beauty, when I, when I do talk about um, beauty, I don't subscribe to a dualism of beauty and the sublime in the way it's often done. But I try to say that the thing about beauty is that it, it arrests us, you know, it stops us in our tracks. There is a resting, so there's a kind of a serene communication between us and the thing of beauty. But there's also a restlessness. So uh, arrest, resting, and a restlessness that we're, we're, we're called to the beyond. That's uh, something finite with its beauty uh, arrests us, we rest in it. But we're called beyond that by, again, the mysterious allure of a more ultimate sense of beauty. Now, this this last uh, restlessness, I think, is bound up with the sense that form itself is itself the outcome of a forming process. And the forming process has a kind of radiance to it, which communicates of something beyond form. But beyond form isn't just, again, a kind of an indeterminate formlessness. It's it's the very source of the forming that has this uh, shine or radiance to it. And that's actually what draws us to beauty, but also draws us beyond to uh, something more mysterious that we can't, most most of the time we can't quite pin it down. In fact, we can never pin it down, but it's, 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 it's again, it's, it's strange opening of the soul to something that um, uh, fulfills it in the very longing itself. Not in the possession, but in the kind of longing for... Uh, something that uh, exceeds us. Um, so that sense of dynamic form, I, 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 I think that's an area for, 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 for deeper exploration. We, we tend to think of form as again a determinate form, and I, I think that that is only what, there's a there is a certain determinacy, but the determinacy is strangely porous to what exceeds determination and. That's where the shine of beauty, I think, has to be located. That's where the, the radiance that some classical aestheticians have talked about. Um, so, I, I, again, I, I, what I'm saying, I think, is in, in the spirit of your own, I take it to be in the spirit of your own suggestion. Um, you know, for instance, in Aquinas' aesthetics, the, the notion of integrity, consonancia, and claritas, they're the three attributes, supposedly, of the beautiful. But um, claritas as the third, is sometimes they speak of the splendor forme, the splendor of the form. But the thing about splendor is that it's not just a form. It's something beyond form, in the form itself. It's, again, this shine, this radiance, this drawing, drawing of the beholder to, to something that exceeds any determinate form. Um, by the way, you know, this, this notion, uh, the, the notion of the indeterminate, in, as as I've developed things over the years, I tend to talk about the indeterminate in this sense of lacking determination, but also this positive sense of the overdeterminate, which carries the heft of a too muchness. It can sometimes seem to be nothing in particular, but it's nothing in particular because it's more than all determination. It's again the sense of a hyper, hyperbolic richness uh, in which we again mysteriously participate. But in many, if you like, logics, logics oscillate between the indeterminate and the determinate. But I think that that has to be uh, revisited, revisited also in the light of this sense of the overdeterminate. Yeah. Um, and so beauty in its shine, in this dynamic uh, energy in forming that itself is, in a sense, beyond determinate form, I think this is very much bound up with this 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 saturated sense of the overdeterminate, and also because th things are 
often clearest in their function in in themselves when they're most revealing that which they aren't and that that which they need from their environment i mean th there's you know the idea of if you give your life away you gain it i think has something right. to do with that and the fact that biological higher forms of life require require relationality to to perpetuate themselves i think also is a is a sort of metaphor for that it's that you need you 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 reveal your function the most when you reveal that you're lacking in yourself that which you would need to to exert that function so the, so you're at your most clear in what you are as a as a particular when you're actually not resting in yourself but having to relate to to another right, yeah. By the way, oh. the, 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 the most recent book I published was called The Intimate Universal. And that sense of the intimate universal is just trying to address the point that you're getting at there. That uh, there are a number of different senses of the universal, but the notion of an intimate universal is one in which this deepest uh, sense of singularity is not to be seen as the opposite of a more encompassing sense of the universal as the togetherness or community of all beings. Um, so you can go up or you can go down, you can go out or you can go in, but you'll meet the intimate universal in all the dimensions. Uh, so again, the, I think the philosophical tradition has, has had the tendency to, to separate uh, the particular and the universal in such a way that this, this sense of the intimate universal is not... Uh, is not uh, it, it's it, it, I mean I, I I don't know of anyone else who's talked about the intimate universal so I, but it, it's it's something that actually addresses some of the 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 dualisms between the singular and the universal universal that that bedevil the whole philosophical tradition perhaps the theological tradition also um, that you don't you don't have to sacrifice intimacy and singularity for uh, a, a rich and truly concrete universal. Again, Hegel is in the background there, but I think that Hegel's concrete universal doesn't have enough intimacy in it, doesn't go deep enough into what exceeds uh, determination in, in terms of his logical concept. Going up and going down, as you said, you keep encountering the intimate universal because the intimate universal gives rise to you and it gives rise to the things you encounter as you go up and down, presumably, which reminds me of that phrase that you wrote about how the origin is always, or returning to the origin is always a return to many different beginnings. It's never one yeah. discrete beginning. Yeah. Uh, does that does that draw us into again? In in a sense, it it's telling us that there is coherence to reality, and therefore the pattern within is the pattern without, and and reality is patterned. It has order yeah. to it, but perhaps it's also telling us to or. A lesson that could be drawn is that one can rely on that so that multiple sources can lead to convergence and harmony. It's not necessarily the case that one has to isolate one source or one account from the others in order to impose order because they're likely to diverge and they're likely to lead us into sort of conflict, but, but just the opposite, right? So it, it's a, there's a, maybe an inherent sort of pluralism there, um, which can be taken in many different directions. And I wouldn't want to define what direction necessarily, although I, I was thinking of sort of the medieval polity with its many different, more or less self-governing bodies or uh, that sort of thing. But that's because my background is more organizational and, and political. But it could be right. taken in, in even in, in terms of the study of biology, I think, where you look at organs. The heart doesn't determine what the liver does, but they work very well together overall. So. Yeah, I mean, I take your point also to be... Um that while certain univocalizations are uh, entirely appropriate to to try to univocalize the whole is to fail to do justice to the pluriv plurivocity of the whole and that even causal nexuses are themselves plurivocal rather than simply univocal i'm kind of thinking of the discussion of the gene there in recent years where at least as i understand it as an amateur uh, originally, people seemed to think there was a, a genetic program and it worked its way out in a fairly univocal manner. And as more investigations were done, there are a whole set of factors that actually mingled in networks of interrelations that uh, seriously complexify, but also allow a kind of plasticity and plurality 
in the unfolding of a, a variety of processes. Um, I think that that has been, a, you know, the, the in modernity, and again, we should always be worried about generalizing too much about modernity, but the desire for a more and more precise mathematical university that sets the process going um, affected so many things, like in the in the religious sphere, sola fide or sola scriptura, in political terms, a sense of sovereignty that again had that strong univocal soul in the sense S O L E character to it, um, and less of that. Let's say the medieval pluralism where the circulation of power in a human community was distributed in a in a in a variety of ways, even though it might come to a certain point of concentration in the figure of the king. Um, so uh, I suppose in postmodern times we're recovering or we're trying to recover some sense of this plurivocity. But I I'm, I must say that I have so, some somber thoughts about the the way cybernetics and the new m tools of media communication and so on. There's a, there's a secretly and often insidious university that has that is at work in 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 the whole thing. The surfaces are the surfaces of differences, but there's something at work which is homogenizing in a to me actually quite a worrying way. Postmodern pluralism may be may be the surface of just the, the continuation of a more efficient cybernetic version of. Uh, modern univocalization. Heidegger makes that point in the question concerning technology. I, I don't know if perhaps what you're saying might might not be this exactly, but I mean there is a sense in which the use of certain modern technologies they they foster that habit of mind which reduces the the experience to the category, and in fact even metaphorically again the the fact that we're spending more time looking at flat screens. We're talking on flat screens now, of course. So. <laughs> There's a certain paradox involved in that, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think that Heidegger had a sense of um, the ominous, monstrous power that modern technology was, uh, you know, gathering to itself. Um, I'm not sure how his response to it. I'm, I mean, <clears throat> I'm not sure what his response to it is, <clears throat> um, uh, and how. How <clears throat> how easy it is to escape the the gestell as he puts it the framing of our lives that yeah. has only become more global really since he wrote um, so I think it's a I suppose if you're older you grew up in a say a, a media ethos which looking back now seems relatively simple by comparison with the sort of the the media, I mean the media of communication that now seem to dominate the lives of younger people. Um, now I I I I do worry about the the, the systematization of life that takes place um, at both the political, the economic level, the the sh the level of the religion of shopping, as I call it. For instance, I order books on Amazon, and the the the, the machines clearly have some profile on me. As ordering theological books and uh, books of poetry and philosophy and so on, so again, that's a relatively innocent thing you might say. But I think over over decades, the 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 danger really is that there's a kind of homogenous humanity being produced that is untrue really to the the extraordinary singularity of each of us. And the extraordinary singularity of different communities too, different different peoples that grow in different countries, their traditions, um, their idiomatic ways of talking, uh, their singular ways of feeling, and so on. The the, the danger of a kind of a leveling that uh, the, the universally available uh, cybernetic media can produce. Uh, I, I think that's a really serious. Uh, serious worry where i think we're already living in a world like that so. yeah and and even when suggestions are made for how to localize technology it's often in terms of direct participation which uh, doesn't necessarily take you into your community it, it, it actually it's usually politically uh contextualized instead of having a home page that changes depending on what 
small town you're in so that everybody has a kind of window into the place they're physically in it becomes more about you know feeding us more into the fiction of not the fiction but you know the the far away realities of of the political writ large you know but you know apropos of one of your questions um that we didn't talk, talk about it much but it, the the part 4 of ethics in the between it's just called ethical communities and i talk about um the family and i talk about uh, what i call the community of serviceable disposability which is a kind of a way of trying to capture the kind of rampant uh, instrumentalization of being that has overtaken so much of our lives but there's the community then the community of erotic sovereignty and the community of agapeic service so uh, this is a way of trying to come back to your point that there's no there's a there's a part three is ethical selving which is a kind of plurivocal investigation of different forms of freedom but it seeks into the forms of community and in, in some ways it's the the, the the selving is 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 less ultimate than the community of course and that 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 most recent book the intimate universal the subtitle is on the hidden porosity among a religion art uh, philosophy and politics so there's a there is a kind of political and trans political dimension that i'm trying to address in that book about the intimate universal uh and it it may have some 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 bearing on your own uh, interest in uh, organizational structure and so on you know yes yes there, a, a lot of ideas are sort of occurring to me which really have to do with allowing the particular thing including the particular community or organization to have its integrity to have its life um without reducing it to the imperatives of others while at the same time sort of having this strong sense that that which orders it cannot be infringing on that which orders other equivalent communities i mean you know it it again really comes back to my first question which was that the fact that the absolute is not a body and yet produces discontinuous bodies in discrete yeah. entities that's yeah yeah and and i and i think that that totalizing instinct in politics oftentimes but not just politics in culture as as you indicated in technology has to do with not accepting that an absolute should give rise to discontinuous bodies that have their own imperatives i mean why ought to you know if we have an absolute right. even an ethical absolute it should a, a, allow for no border within itself or within you know but anyway yeah. so but um, you know like that like just one point I try to think of God as an agapeic origin, but one of the reasons why I do that is precisely to think of an origin that gives rise to what is other to itself for the sake of its otherness. So when the agapeic origin is creating, it's not creating itself as other, it's creating another that has its, it, it, its being for itself. It, it's a gifted being for itself, but it's nevertheless its being for itself. And that that release into otherness is entirely positive, I think. Um, and I think that only by some understanding of agapeic um, generosity that we can truly do justice to something being full, overfull in itself, while at the same time giving rise to a, a truly other being that in its own intimate way participates in its own fullness. Um, so that that's that's just you know an amplification of of uh, what I take to be your own intuition about um, giving rise to distinct beings that have their own being for themselves. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean uh, yeah. The the concept of the gift or theologically of grace is is definitely central to that. 